Hi, welcome to the Wednesday edition of Daily Thunder. I'm Leslie Ludi, and I'm excited to dive into part two of our Godly Discernment series. This week, we're going to be talking specifically about how to replace lies with truth. So quick review from our last episode, we, we talked about the subtlety of the enemy's deceit and how it actually does creep into the church more often than we realize and how Paul even warned the early church about this night and day for three years with tears to say, be on your guard against this. Because when error creeps into the church, it doesn't often have a very obvious neon sign associated with it saying this is error. It's usually very deceptive and very cunning and very subtle. So we have the responsibility to ask God for his wisdom and discernment. So we talked about being aware of having itching ears. The Bible talks about the reason that these messages can get into the church is because we are prone to having those itching ears where we just want to hear something pleasant, not necessarily something true. So we have to really grapple with that in our own lives and ask God, Lord, am I the kind of Christian who is willing to hear truth, even if it's not pleasant and nice sounding, even if it brings some conviction? Secondly, to make God's word your lifeline. Don't treat the Bible as kind of a secondary resource or kind of something that you, you turn to only when you really have to. Make it the, the lamp to your feet and the light to your path. Now getting into some more practical ways to build godly discernment into our lives. The third principle I want to share with you is to embrace what I call the old paths of Christianity. And what I mean by that is avoiding that consumer mentality that has crept into our modern thinking. When you look back at historic Christianity and the great biographies of Christian men and women that we look up to and just the Christian heroes throughout scripture and throughout history, you do not see them being driven to have their whims catered to. They were all about the glory of God, and that's what makes their lives and testimonies so powerful. And that's what my desire is, that I wouldn't just fall into this trap of saying, I want everything to cater to me. In our Western culture, that's just what we're used to. We want everything to be, you know, feed into our desires. And it's kind of like we go church shopping and it's like, well, I want this kind of music and this kind of preaching and this kind of small group. And it has to look this way and be that way, as opposed to, I want to glorify God. I want to gather together with other believers and lift high the name of Jesus. And it's not about just my whims and my wants. And I think a lot of times Christian leaders and publishers are really scrambling to try to keep their customers happy. Unfortunately, that's oftentimes the way that they approach it. And we talked last episode about how the Christian books and music that are feeding into the church are oftentimes coming out of the industry. It's not necessarily a ministry. It's a money a ministry. It's a money making industry. And so therefore, the, those who are in charge of that industry often are thinking, OK, how do we give our customers what they want? How do we keep them happy? How do we keep them coming back for more? And a lot of times they look at they're trying to compete with the culture. They look at the bells and whistles in the culture and they think, how do we bring that into the church so that we keep people eager to, to you know, engage with what we have to offer? Instead of saying, we're going to lift high the truth of Jesus Christ, they say, we're going to add Xboxes to our Sunday school classes to keep the kids interested. We're going to add coffee bars to our church lobbies to keep people wanting to come on a Sunday morning. We're going to make you know these really cool, trendy, artistic versions of the Bible so people will actually want to read it. I remember... Quite a number of years ago, there was this Bible zine is what it was called. It was for young, like teenage girls. And it was basically turning the Bible into a fashion magazine with beauty tips and articles about clothes and guys and romance and some scripture in there too. And that was like to replace the Bible. And a lot of times it's just because we as Christians kind of demand, you know, we have that consumer mentality. And how do we avoid becoming a Christian consumer and go back to those old paths of Christian Christianity that was just simple and focused on Jesus Christ and the glory of God? Well, I think, again, it comes back to asking a different question. Last time we talked about not asking, what, how do I feel about this, but what does God say about this? Now here's another question that we should be asking, not what am I getting out of this? Is this pleasing to me? But what is God getting out of this? So if you come into a worship service or a message or a church gathering of any kind, that should be the question on our hearts, not what am I getting out of this? But is God getting glory out of this? What is he getting out of this? Is Are we able to worship him and lift his name high and exalt him? Remember the simplicity of Christ. His truth and the message of what he does, did for us on the cross is so powerful in and of itself. When we try to add human bells and whistles to it, oftentimes we overshadow that beautiful, power, powerful simplicity of the gospel. It says in John 12, 32, these are the words of Jesus, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to me. And that is true not only symbolically for Jesus being lifted up 
on the cross, but also in general, when he and his truth are lifted up, people are naturally drawn. There's an amazing story from Christian history about an evangelist named R.A. Torrey who went to England, I think it was in the early 1900s, and he felt called to lead these revival meetings there in the city. And he booked the Royal Albert Hall, which was the biggest venue at the time that you could book. And he booked it for an entire month. And so all of these newspaper people were asking him, you know, how do you expect to fill the Royal Albert Hall with simply just a gospel message for a solid month? Because even the most popular circus performers and opera singers and whatever was popular at that time cannot fill the Royal Albert Hall for more than a couple of days. And he said, this was the verse that he went back to. Jesus said, if I am lifted up, I will draw all men to me. So all they did was they simply prayed that God would draw people and they got up on that stage and they just preached the gospel without bells and whistles. You know, a lot of Christians had come to R.A. Torrey before these meetings started and said, you know, why don't you add uh, an opera singer? Why don't you add a circus act? Why don't you add something to attract people? And he said, no, the cross of Jesus Christ is going to be the attraction. Well, what happened as a result of taking that stand, stripping away all the human you know, bells and whistles and smoke and lights and just lifting high the name of Jesus. Actually, what happened st- stunned everybody, including you know the secular media and the church, because people packed the Royal Albert Hall night after night. And in fact, usually there was a crowd waiting outside in the rain oftentimes to get in for a second service. And they didn't just book it for a month. They booked it, I think, for two or three months solid and really did nothing by human standards that would draw people. So it was really just the simplicity of Jesus Christ and the power of the gospel that drew that kind of a crowd. We oftentimes just are afraid to stand just on the simplicity of Christ today. Now, of course, it's not wrong to use artistic means and and media and the performing arts and those kinds of things to communicate the gospel. But oftentimes we make it all about those things and we kind of diminish the cross of Jesus Christ as a result. I think it can be really helpful to study the lives of Christian men and women throughout history who walked those old paths of the simple, uncomplicated, powerful Christianity that has always changed the world. So people like Hudson Taylor, George Mueller, D.L. Moody, R.A. Torrey that I've just mentioned, C.T. Studd, Jim Elliott, Catherine Booth, Elizabeth Fry, Amy Carmichael, Esther on Kim, Corey Ten Boom, Gladys Edward, there are many more. When you read their stories, you recognize that they were all about one singular thing, Jesus Christ. And when they went into a situation, whether it was the mission field or a church environment, they were not asking the question, how can I be catered to? How can I have my whims and my desires met? They were thinking, how do I bring glory to the name of Jesus, even if it requires sacrifice on my part? If we as Christians adopted that attitude, I think we would see a big shift in the church feeling like it needs to scramble to keep Christians interested and coming back. And, and the fourth principle to build godly discernment into our lives is to remember what it all boils down to, and that is Jesus Christ and him crucified. So we've already been talking about, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to me. Christianity in a nutshell is all about Jesus. So I would encourage you to set your gaze upon him and let him direct your steps. Let him fix your gaze upon him instead of the bells and the whistles of this world. It really boils down to a simple mentality that says, I'm going to reject messages that lead me away from Jesus. And I'm going to embrace messages that lead me into a deeper relationship with him, a fuller surrender to him. Jude 120 says to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. I love that scripture because it says it really reminds us that it is God who keeps us from stumbling and equips us to shine as lights in the midst of a perverse and crooked generation. So if we keep our eyes on Jesus, he will keep us from stumbling. And that's very comforting when we're taking an up-close and personal look at the error that so often creeps into the church. I want to take a quick look just for a minute at some of the trendy messages that have crept into modern Christianity and just quickly contrast them with the truth of the word of God. And just to show you, just to give you an example that if you know the word of God and you are lifting high the name of Jesus in your life, you'll be so much quicker to recognize this, recognize the subtle errors that creep into a lot of the trendy messages that hit the church today. The first trendy message that you might be familiar with is that It is important to build up your self-esteem and pursue your own desires. 
So I remember getting this when I was in youth group, you know, 12 or 13 years old, the whole me- the whole purpose of youth group seemed to be build up your self-esteem, make you feel good about yourself. It's all about you, you, you. And I understand where that idea comes from because we have a lot of insecurity, especially among young people today in a culture that's constantly lifting an impossible standard up and saying, you need to look like this. You need to you know, be a movie star or else you're, you know, you're not valuable. And so we have, te- we in the church have, have tended to swing and say, oh, you know, it's all about self esteem. It's all about, you know, pursuing your own desires. And, but God's message is very different. He says, deny yourself and follow me. So it's not about self esteem. It's about self denial. Jesus says in Matthew 16, 24, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And deny in that verse means to forget oneself, to lose sight of yourself and your own interests. And when I came face to face with that truth, it was such a game changer for me because I had been so insecure and I'd been trying to build up my self-esteem and feel good about myself. And that never led to real security. But when I recognized, you know, I can lose sight of myself and make my life all about Jesus, not care what people think of me, only care what they think of him. And suddenly I had this incredible confidence and security because it was a Christ confidence and not a self-confidence. So again, you know, it doesn't mean that we're not valuable to God, but God's message is not the self-esteem message. And so it's just that subtle shift of saying, what does the word of God actually say? Another trendy message is that Christians need to be more honest and authentic in their relationships with each other. Really, we need to be able to say whatever we want to say without being judged. Probably you've gotten that vibe from church circles or Bible study groups or on social media or whatever. That's a very popular message today. God's message is slightly different than that. He says that we are to be discreet and honorable and edifying and Christ-focused with our words. It's not just honesty and authenticity and saying whatever we feel like. In fact, Proverbs 29, 11 says, a fool vents all of his feelings, but a wise man holds them back. Now, that's definitely not the message you're going to hear in a lot of churches today because we are very much encouraged to vent all of our feelings and even looked at as unspiritual if we don't. But God is saying, this is the path of wisdom. Don't just share everything with everyone. Proverbs 29, 20 says, do you see a man hasty in his words? There is more hope for a fool than for him. And then, of course, Ephesians 4, 29, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but that, that but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearer. So our goal in communication isn't just this raw and real, just let everything fly. It's imparting grace to our hearers. It's It's saying things that are edifying and lead people closer to Jesus Christ. There's a time and a place to share some of our deepest struggles with trusted people who can point us back to truth, but anywhere and everywhere on social media and all around the body of Christ and anytime we feel like it is not the time and the place for that. Another trendy message says it's better to dialogue and converse about truth instead of listen to someone preach because everyone's opinion is equally valid. That is a classic postmodern mindset where it is this mushy reasoning toward the word of God. But God says something different. There is only one opinion that is right, and that is God's. Unless we agree with God's opinion, our own opinion is worthless. It says in 1 Corinthians one twenty five, the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. And of course, Romans 3, 4, let God be true and every man a liar. So be very watchful of those kind of messages that say, hey, everyone's opinion is equally valid. God's opinion is the opinion that matters. Another trendy message says this. It's important to be yourself boldly, to just be you and let the world deal with it. Don't try to, you know, cater to what anyone expects of you. Just be who you want to be. First Corinthians 6.20 says that when we choose to follow Christ, we are no longer our own for we have been bought at a price. And Colossians 3.3 says we have died and our lives are hidden with Christ in God. Now, hidden in this verse means to conceal and to escape notice. It's not about being ourselves boldly. It's about being set free from sin and the flesh so that we can be all about Jesus. God didn't set us, he didn't send Jesus to this earth to set us free to be ourselves. He set us free from ourselves so that we can be completely his. So again, it's that subtle difference, but it makes a world of difference in how we approach our Christianity, depending on which message we're listening to. A great example of this is John the Baptist, who was not all about, I'm just going to be me. I just want to get my message out there to the world. In fact, he said, I must decrease so that he, meaning Jesus, would increase. And that needs to be the message of our lives. Another trendy message says, you know, stop trying to people please. Don't please other people. People pleasing is a sin. Don't jump through hoops for others. Don't try to prove anything. Just live your own life. Live the life that you want to live. God's message actually says that we are called to serve those around us, to put our own interests aside and consider the other person's highest good. 
It says in Romans 15, 2 through 3, each of us is to please his neighbor for his good, to his edification, for even Christ did not please himself. And of course, we have Paul's example in Philippians 2, 17, where he says, even if I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service, service of your faith, I rejoice. Paul said, it's a privilege to be poured out on behalf of the saints. Now, of course, it's important to serve others for the right reasons. If we're doing it for selfish motives or to impress others or, you know, to be noticed by others, then our motives are going to be skewed and we will be people pleasing in a sinful wrong way. But if we are serving others for the glory of God to shine his love and his light to this world, we are actually in step with him. So these are just a few examples of modern trendy messages that you may be hearing today and how the word of God takes us in a different direction. And again, it goes back to making the word of God our lifeline. If you ever hear a message that sounds kind of good and attractive, but you're not totally sure, go to the word of God and make sure that that message completely and totally lines up with the truth of scripture. The absolute best way to replace lies with truth in your life is to become grounded in the word of God. I would encourage you to practice searching for answers in the word of God. If you are struggling with something or confused about something, rather than just immediately turning to the thoughts and the ideas of others, it's very easy to click, you know, on social media and to open our computer and Google search something to try to find answers. And we need to remember that human wisdom does have its place, but only when it points us back to the word of God, because that is the ultimate source of true wisdom. Here are just a few practical ways that I'd like to encourage you to begin this process in your life this week. Fill your mind with scripture as often as you possibly can. And I've said in other episodes, other podcasts that I've done, that when we're busy, especially in a child raising season of life, or if you have a really busy job, it may not be possible to sit down and read the word of God for two hours every day. But if you listen to audio scripture throughout your day, you can be filling your mind with truth as you're doing other things. There are usually ways to get the word of God into our lives if we really want to. Commit key scriptures to memory. So if you have scriptures that God has really impressed upon your heart, memorize them because the more scripture that you have hidden in your heart, the quicker you'll recognize lies and deception and be able to replace those lies with truth. You think about Jesus when he was tempted by Satan in the wilderness, he had truth hidden in his heart. So every time the enemy came at him with a lie, he was able to say it is written and immediately combat that with truth. I would also encourage you to learn how to dig deeper into the word of God. Understand inductive Bible study. Don't just take, you know, the surface of what you're reading, but go deep into the meaning of the words and the context and, you know, the Greek definition and really understand what's being said in each verse that you're reading. Again, when you're struggling with something, ask God to guide you as you read his word. There have been a lot of times when I've been struggling with something and I don't even know where to turn to in the Bible, but I start reading wherever I feel prompted to read in the Psalms or the Proverbs or you know, some book of the New Testament. And I say, God, open my eyes to your truth and show me how your truth applies to this situation. It's amazing how many times I stumble across a verse that is perfect for whatever I'm going through. I would also encourage you to read stories of the great Christians in history and especially notice how they applied scripture to their problems. That's probably one of the things I admire most about the list of men and women that I mentioned earlier. Whenever they struggled with anything, they went to scripture and they applied scripture to their problems. And we would do so well to follow their example rather than Google search to solve our problems. Don't entertain notions or ideas or messages that disagree with God's word. It does not matter how artistic or new and trendy or exciting or pleasant they might sound. If they don't agree with God's word, they don't belong in our lives. Corey Ten Boom talks about going into the concentration camp Ravensbrück, one of the most hellish places on earth at the time. And she said to God, if we are able to bring our Bible into this place, I know that we can survive even hell itself. And God miraculously allowed her to get her Bible in there. And that was what carried she and her sister through the darkest time of their life. So don't leave God's word in the background. We have the privilege of going to the word of God for anything and everything that we need. And when we do, our feet will be planted on solid ground and we'll be building our lives around true wisdom. God bless. A lot of us have doctrines, but they're not tied together because we lack a global understanding of scripture. We lack a global understanding of how to rightly apply it. The kingdom of heaven is based on facts, truth. Jesus Christ himself is the truth. And when you get him right, and you know how to rightly appropriate it in your life, and you get those tools, then suddenly Christianity begins to shine. It lifts off the page, it functions, it lives. If you have a passion along these lines and you would desire a season just set apart, able to focus on the person of Jesus, 
I'd love you to consider being a part of a semester here at Ellerslie.